The program starts in five minutes. starts in one minute. Program starts now.
Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to all of you joining us today from all over the world. My name is Dr. Sonali Chaturvedi from the Train and Shine team of Hyderabad Runners. Hyderabad Runners is a non profit running group and the creator and organizer of the city's only full marathon, toughest one actually, the AHL Hyderabad Marathon, also popularly known as AHM. Our vision has always been to promote running, fitness, and active lifestyles, which we have been doing for the past 13 years through hundreds of our mentors and ambassadors all over the city and outside too. Couch to 5K for helping the beginners run, outdoor kids program to catch them young and fit, year long fitness training sessions at Train and Shine are just some of our key initiative in this regard. Currently, uh, we all are in a very unprecedented situation facing a lockdown which has been there for almost 70 days. Runners or non-runners, these COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 times are tough for all of us. So maintaining emotional and physical health during this crisis can be a challenge. There are so many questions which many of us have, but we don't know whom to ask. Running any marathon event looks a far possibility currently, but not to get disheartened. This is the time to upskill ourselves. In these turbulent times, we bring you Beyond the Track, a one-hour live webinar series of conversations with some of our highly distinguished experts from running and sports field to help you equip yourselves with both theoretical knowledge as well as practical training. In the sixth edition of Beyond the Track, we are honored to connect you to Dr. Ashish Contractor, who is a marathon runner himself and a pioneer in cardiac rehabilitation. The Q&A section will be taken by Dr. Madhumati Sanjay, who herself is a leading gynecologist of the city and a very active member in Hyderabad Runners Group. Uh, before I leave you all, let me quickly remind you all once again by requesting some patience in case if any network issue arises. We'll do our best to make this a smooth learning experience for you all. Uh, also, we have some questions which are sent to you, sent to us all uh, by you all. But we'll ask to our speaker and request you all to post other questions in the comment sections of the video, and we'll get them answered to the best of our ability. So, without further ado, I would like to invite our own Dr. Murli Nanabanini, who is the president of Hyderabad Runners, to introduce and welcome our speaker for the today. Enjoy. Over to you, Murli. Thank you. Thank you, Sonali. Thank you very much. Good evening and a warm welcome to all of you uh, who are here today with us for these wonderful uh, Beyond the Track webinar series brought to you by the Hyderabad Runners, of course. These have been actually fabulous interactions and with eminent uh, speakers from all over, you know, mostly in the US and India as well. And it's a fantastic, well-received program from the training team at the Hyderabad Runners. And today, I have the honor of introducing our eminent speaker. I'm sure those of you who might not be familiar with him will get familiar with him today. Otherwise, he is actually somebody just like uh, most of us, passionate runner and a physician as well. He has been avidly promoting and uh, working towards something like what we do, uh, working uh, towards promoting fitness, health, and wellness amongst people. So he's actively been doing that, apart from being a physician. That's his main day job. So let me take this honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ashish Contractor, who, like most of us, is also a practicing physician at uh, the Sir HN Reliance Hospital in Mumbai. And out there, he's the HOD or the head of the department for the rehab medicine and sports medicine. He's also been active uh, with the Asian Heart Institute before that. And he's got a whole bunch of other you know, designations and qualifications throughout the world. But for most of you, I'm sure you can research him a little bit later and find out all that. But what's most important for us today are the juicy parts. He's a runner and he has been, he was the medical director for the Mumbai Marathon for many years. So this doctor is one of us and he's one guy who puts his foot where his mouth is. So he's actually running and doing things and preaching about them. Unlike, you know, some doctors who we say, you know, practice, don't practice what uh, they do, but practice what they preach. So he's a different kind of guy. 
and he will be giving us a lot of juicy bits, I'm sure, on running a marathon, and he understands all this. And more importantly, he completed the Mumbai Marathon in three hours and 38 minutes this year. Now, that takes the cake from him, and whatever it is, that should give him all the qualification credibility to say whatever he wants to say. And uh, so thank you, you know, for sparing your time today. He's an avid speaker, I'm sure. And I believe today he had some other seminar as well. He had to cut short, come here, and then take the time to be with us today. So we really appreciate that, Ashish. And uh, okay. there are a whole bunch of things. Apart from speaking and running and practicing, he's also a writer. I think in 2016, he wrote a book, The Heart Truth. I think it talks about, you know, you break your heart, somebody breaks your heart, he'll fix it or something like that. <laughs> and also, I found out uh, he's been in that same line after writing The Heart Truth, he's been blogging about, I think, uh, when it is safe to resume sex after a heart attack. So anyway, let me, let me not take much of your time. And with that introduction, all the way from about 700 miles or kilometers away in Mumbai, from some, you know, safe dark room or quiet room, let me welcome the guest speaker for today, Dr. Ashish Contractor. Ashish, it's all yours from Dilsi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Murli. I'm actually speaking um, from my hospital. So there wasn't enough time to get home. So I said I'll conduct it from my hospital room itself. I trust that you all can see me and you all can hear me clearly. Um, thanks very much for that lovely introduction. I hope, like you said, I put my foot where my mouth is and not in my mouth when I'm speaking to you today. Okay, so thanks to Rajesh Vetsha and the entire Hyderabad Runners team for putting to this together. I'll tell you one thing, I am really, really eager to run the Hyderabad Marathon, okay? Not just to come to Hyderabad, but the level of preparation that I've seen this team do just to put this webinar together, I can well imagine what will be your level of preparation for the actual race itself, okay? So hats off to you guys. I've been speaking all over the world for the last 20 years and nowhere in any of my talks has this level of preparation gone. So thanks for this and thanks Niranjan uh, for putting it all together from a technical standpoint. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is let me also get my tech correct. I'm gonna share my uh, screen and I'm gonna share the PPT. Here we go. Super. So I guess you all can uh, see my see my screen uh, as well as see me. So Niranjan, if there is anything we need to change, do let me know. So today we've uh, entitled the topic as Run With Your Heart. And what I intend doing over the next maybe 20, 25 minutes is actually to cover a lot of ground to talk about the involvement of the heart in running. And specifically, I want to address this whole issue about um, is it safe to run? When should you not run? Do you, you know, help your heart? Do you endanger your heart? What are the precautions you need to take? Because, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of fear also which goes in and around this subject, okay? So this is just a picture of our hospital. It's a Sir H. and Reliance Foundation Hospital in, in Mumbai. It's, it's very close to the Marine Drive Chapati. So those of you who run the marathon, the Mumbai Marathon will know this route. So we're just about uh, 800 meters away from the Chapati Beach. I'm gonna very quickly lead you to the topic of um, exercise as medicine. And since it's medicine, like all medicine, there will be an optimum dose. Medicines have adverse effects, side effects. So what happens if you overdose? What are some of the precautions and testing that you need to do? And then we'll have our conclusion at the end and hopefully a very lively Q&A to follow. So this was the Times of India in 2016. And let me try and enlarge my screen. As you can probably read out there, it says stop Gynac, Gynac collapses while training for the marathon and dies. And uh, this was Dr. Sinha, a very well-known gynecologist, someone I knew well as well. And it was very tragic that he one day collapsed in December, last week of December prior to the Mumbai Marathon. And I'm sure in, actually I hope not, but I would imagine that in Hyderabad newspapers also you might have seen similar headlines when people have um, unfortunately passed away while running. And then the second page spoke about how 
run is trained gradually and you have to you know, increase your exercise gradually and your cardiac risk goes up. And this box was actually a, a set of tips that were provided by me on the do's and don'ts uh, when you take this up. This was 2016, uh, November of last year, we had another headline says marathon or cop dies of heart attack while running. And obviously this creates a lot of, um, how shall I say, fear in the minds of people. And I hope that by the end of the talk today, a lot of that fear is dissipated. And a lot of the questions that you have are answered. In fact, more than the questions you have, I hope that the questions your family has are answered. So most of you, I assume, are sitting at home and watching this. So if you have a spouse or a loved one who's worried about you running, please, there's still time. Come and ask them to sit for this presentation, okay? And just to get to, get, get to know you and get a sense of who the audience is, I'd ask Niranjan to pose a couple of questions. And one of them was, how many of you actually run the full marathon, the 42-kilometer race? Also wanted to know that how many of you had run 10 or more events in total, any distance, just to get a sense. So if you put those answers up and maybe Niranjan can let me know as the talk progresses, just to get a sense, okay? So we talk about this phrase of exercise is medicine. And this is actually an entire movement. I work very closely with the American College of Sports Medicine. In fact, coincidentally, today was meant to be a day I was meant to be in San Francisco with the American College of Sports Medicine. They have a um, their annual meeting is always in the last week of May and it starts from a Wednesday to a Saturday and right now Saturday would be when it would typically get over and they have this whole movement called exercise is medicine. So all of us know of the good effects of exercise okay so imagine if you could put all those good effects and just make it into one pill. We know that exercise reduces the risk of heart disease by about 40 percent reduces the risk of stroke by about 27%, diabetes by almost half, similarly blood pressure by almost half, reduces mortality and risk of not just breast cancer, but several different types of cancer, colon cancer as well, okay? Alzheimer's by a third. So, X, and all of these are published data, okay? This is not something I decided to put together in a slide to impress the Hyderabad runners on you know, 30th May. These are actual published data, the good effects. And to get the good effects of all of this, it's not too expensive. What do you need? All you need is this, right? And all of you are avid runners. So you know how the trends in running keep changing. Nowadays, people don't even need this. People are running barefoot, right? Minimal running, barefoot. So all you need are a pair of legs. And I actually tell people, you know what? You don't even need that. This gentleman running with the flag, many of you in Hyderabad may be familiar with him. And you can see that red circle that I've drawn. That's where his leg ought to have been. And instead, there's a prosthesis. This is a good friend of mine, Major D.P. Singh. D.P. was 25 years old in 1999 in July. And most of you will remember what happened in 99 July. We had the Kargil War. And a bomb blew up right close to him. He was in hospital for an entire year before he could even take his first steps. And to cut a long story short, he took step by step by step till a point today where he's running marathons all over the city, all over the world as well. Okay? So Niranjan just told me that 53% of you run the full marathon. Wow, that's a really, really high number. So DP not only um, has overcome this obstacle, he's actually inspired others to do it as well. Okay. And what's, what's really inspiring, like I told you, that you don't need shoes to run. You don't even need feet to run. All you need to run is heart. And the next picture is a picture which I've used in a lot of my talks. And I'm really, really happy that for the first time, it's going to be used in a talk where it's most significant. Because as you can see, it's got the Airtel Hyderabad Marathon in the background, okay? So here is DP in the center of the picture in front of the small child with the group that he's found called the Challenging Ones. These are all athletes. Uh, you may or not be able to appreciate in the, on your screen, 
who have a prosthesis. Some have two prostheses, some have one. And he encourages them to run all over. And this was a picture taken at the Hyderabad Marathon. I'm, I'm thinking it was 2012, 13, I'm not too sure. But, um, you know, this is, this is a picture right in your hometown, okay? So the bottom line message out here is that to run, to reap the benefits of exercise, all you need is heart, okay? That's important. This data is actually from your Hyderabad runners. Um, the University of Hyderabad did a study and, and um, Niranjan and team and Rajesh and team sent it over to me. It was 92 pages. My God, I was really impressed. I tried to skim through as much as possible. But this is a selected sort of section from it. This, these are your answers, okay? So all of you sitting on the other end listening, uh, perceived health benefits of exercise, about 22% of the women thought that there was fitness and energy boost, 18% of males. Stress management, okay? Exercise is a great stress buster. 14% um, of women and 10% of 11% of men thought that improved metabolism, weight loss. Surprisingly, more men, I would have imagined more females would have, but I'm, I'm wrong on that, thought, you know, or that they did it for the weight loss benefit and then there were the others, okay? So bottom line, is there are lots of health benefits of exercise, but to me, the most important benefit, and I'm sure most of you sitting on the other end out there will agree, is that it makes you feel good. Forget about cholesterol, forget about weight loss, forget about blood pressure, it makes you feel good. When I say forget about all these things, I don't literally mean forget, they're extremely important. But I think the best benefit is it makes you feel good, right? I'm sure you'll agree with me on that one. Therefore, I like this quote. Normal, normally, people say distance makes the heart grow fonder. So this is a nice line which says distance makes the heart grow stronger. The heart is a muscle. And like all other muscles in your body, to grow, to continue giving body good benefit, it needs to be exercised. Okay, so distance makes your heart grow stronger. So we went through the bit about exercise being medicine. Then what's the optimum dose? How much, how much should you do of the exercise, okay? I'm not gonna go into detail on this part because honestly, you know, you are such an organized running group. I'm sure your, your coaches, your mentors have discussed this time and again. And in the Q&A, we can always address some specific questions you have. But normally when we talk about exercise, we talk about something called the FIT principle where F stands for frequency, how often do you exercise? As you all know, you don't have to exercise or you shouldn't be exercising strenuously seven days a week, okay? So unless maybe you're an, a, a professional level runner, you are recommended to take at least one rest day, if not more. Intensity, how hard do you do it? You can measure intensity by your heart rate, by the level of breathing frequency, by just how you feel, which is called a rating of perceived exertion. T is time, how many minutes do you do it for? And the next T is for type. There is aerobic exercise, which is running, which we all talk about. But there's also anaerobic exercise, strength training exercise. All of these are the different types of exercises. And why are we primarily running? One of the reasons is it improves your VO2 max. Okay. Um, for those of you who come regularly to Mumbai, you may recognize this gentleman out here. Any of you recognize him? This is Savio, Savio D'Souza one of the very loved running coaches, especially in South Mumbai. So your VO2 max is really the gold standard of your cardiorespiratory fitness, okay? And a very important indicator of performance. Not the only indicator, but a very important indicator. And the formula is that your VO2 max, for those of you who are geeky and like these things, VO2 max is equal to your cardiac output which is the amount of blood your heart pumps out each minute into something called AVO2, which is your arterial venous oxygen difference, okay? Arterial venous oxygen difference, which is the oxygen extraction capacity of your muscles when you're exercising. So the more endurance exercises you do, it's VO2 max. So as runners, it's great to know your VO2 max. So this is me doing a VO2 max for Savio. Unfortunately, there are very, very few places in the country where we can do a VO2 max. Luckily, our hospital is one of them where you can get on the treadmill, you go through a protocol. We usually use the cruise protocol and you see your VO2 max. 
Now, two of the three people you see in this picture have fabulous VO2 maxes, among the best in the world. And you know, if you recognize who the lady on the left is and who the gent on the right is, I'm pretty sure you will, most of you will get the, get the gent who's on the right. And I'm not talking about me. But do you know who this lady is? And the man. Okay, so Niranjan, let's see how many get it right. And maybe they can get a free 10K run or something next time. Okay. All right. Since we are talking about the adverse effect, sorry, since we are talking about Oh, yes, Rajesh is the first one who got it right. So that, that was Paula Radcliffe. No, that's not Radisha. No. You got the tough one right, but you got the easy one wrong. So that is, that is Paula Radcliffe, who's the women's world record, marathon world record holder for many, many years till it was broken just about in October of last year. Okay. And the gentleman on the right is probably considered the greatest of all time uh, marathoner. That's uh, Eliud Kipchoge. This, this is Eliud. Okay. All right. So since we spoke about the exercise being medicine, what are some of the adverse effects of medicine? What can go wrong? Okay. Let me show you this picture. So while it's a painting, as you can clearly see, um, this is a, um, this was the cover of the European Heart Journal in 2011, when they had a special issue on the whole topic of cardiac deaths during running. And as Rajesh correctly put up in the chat box, this is a picture or a painting of Philippides. Um, I'm sure many of you avid marathoners would know the story of Philippides, but for those of you who don't, okay, Philippides was a messenger in ancient times. So when the Greeks were in a battle with the Persians, they won the battle. And the battle was formed, or rather, the battle was fought in a place called Marathon. So when they won the battle, Philippides, who was the messenger, went running from Marathon to Athens to convey the news. In those days, they didn't have cell phones where they could just WhatsApp saying, hey, we won the war, right? Actually, I had people running across. And that distance was 42.2 kilometers. And that's forever known as the Marathon. Legend has it that Philippides delivered the message and he died after delivering the message. Now, I don't know whether that's accurate or not. I have read several different accounts which say that, you know what, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't die. He actually then went next day and went to Sparta and he went, you know, to several different places. There's actually a race called the Spartathlon every year, which is meant to go through the same route as Philippides went. If I'm not mistaken, it's roughly a 650 kilometer race over several days. I'm not sure exactly how, over how many days, but you can Google it. It's called the Spartathlon. Okay, so this was supposedly the first cardiac death. Now, I'm just going to show you one, if I may say so, scientific article. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine by Aaron Bagish and group. Aaron Bagish is from Harvard Medical School and he speaks at the ACSM meeting every year and I get a chance to always talk and sort of you know, brainstorm with him. Um, this is looking at cardiac arrest during long distance running races. And they saw all the races which happened in the United States from 2000 to 2010. Okay. And they had roughly 11 million uh, runners. And out of those, 59 had a cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest could be considered as sort of a pre death uh, rhythm, which is about 0.54 per 100,000 participants. Okay. The rate of cardiac uh, sorry, yeah, the rate of cardiac arrest was one per eight, 184,000 participants, and the rate of sudden death was one per 259,000 participants. So your risk of dying statistically during a race is very, very low. Okay, obviously for each and every person that death that happens, it's a huge loss to the family and friends. So we obviously take it very seriously. And research has shown that the two largest causes of death in the younger age group, where we typically say below 35, and there's no hard and fast rule that if at 34, it has to be younger and 37, it has to be older, right? But generally in the younger one, especially in the 20s, 25, 27 kind of age group, one of the very common causes is something called HCM, which stands for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, okay? It's kind of, it could be genetic. It's a condition that the heart swells up but it swells up not due to training, it swells up due to disease. So it's a big heart, but not a strong heart, okay? It's a flabby heart. 
and the majority then over 35 is CAD, which just stands for coronary artery disease. In other words, the traditional blockage as we call it, okay? India has among the highest rate of CAD in the world and Indians are very prone, both men and women, okay? So as you train, as you become athletes, your ECG changes, and I'm not gonna spend much time on the next couple of slides because they're quite technical, but there were different, different guidelines from 2010, 2013, 2014, 2017, looking at what are normal changes and what are athletic changes. There is something called an athlete's heart, okay? And I'm not gonna, don't worry if you can't read this slide, but this is just the latest guidelines on when is it normal to have, if I may call it, an abnormal ECG. So if an athlete has signs of what's called left ventricular hypertrophy on an ECG, you usually don't need to worry. If they have something called incomplete right bundle branch block, many of you may have had an ECG and they said RBBB. Sinus bradycardia. Sinus bradycardia means heart rate below 60. And we all know that it's very common for marathon runners to have a heart rate below 60. Okay, so they tell you what are the normal criteria, what are borderline findings, and what are clearly abnormal findings. Okay, this is just some guidelines, and all of you who are running marathons should at least have an ECG at some point and then show their ECG to a doctor who understands running, who understands athletes. Otherwise, some of the athletic changes that they see, they may call it abnormal when for an athlete it's it's actually quite normal. Okay. Um, again, this is just a complicated technical slide showing ultimately how the heart goes into an abnormal rhythm. Um, one of the things I want to point out in this is that often immediately post-exercise, look at the left side of the graph where it says abrupt cessation of activity. It typically happens, right? You run a race, you're running a half marathon, you're killing yourself, you reach the finish line and you just stop or you finish the full marathon and you just stop. And at that time, your blood pools in your legs and a whole bunch of um, reactions take place, which ultimately can lead to bad heart rhythms, which could lead to collapse and even death, which is why at the end of every race, at least where I'm the medical director, we always insist to tell people that they need, sorry, that they need, my, they, at the end of every race, we always tell people that they need to continue walking not to suddenly stop because that leads to the venous pooling of blood, which is not good, okay? Pay attention to this uh, particular slide. This is looking at what are called the prodromal symptoms that happen to subjects within a week of their SCD. SCD stands for sudden cardiac death. Let me explain what this means. In that same study, they looked at all the people who had this sudden cardiac death and they saw that, did they have any warning signs or were they sudden? And you know what? Out of the 45 subjects, they found that 15 had some chest pain or angina. A large number had increasing fatigue, so shortness of breath, okay? So people did typically get warning signals, which they tended to ignore, okay? I want to spend time on these two slides. Um, when I was giving a, a similar lecture to a group of, of students, uh, one of them came up to me and said, you know what, sir, what you said is absolutely correct when we were training, and this is in Mumbai, and this happened in 2013, July, and she told me the story of two runners she knew who collapsed. And, and I told her, please write down the story in your exact words, okay? And this is what she wrote in her exact words. The first runner was age about 46, 47. He had a history of running since three years. He had attempted three to four half marathons, regular runner. Um, he was unwell one evening, felt a burning sensation thought it was just because of the food he had had, because he had oily food, bhajjas, vada pao. He came for a run the next morning, still being unwell. The coach told him not to run. He went against the wishes of the coach, went for a short run thinking, oh, don't worry, everything will be fine. Five to seven minutes into the run, he came back as he was extremely uncomfortable. He collapsed on the stairs on the way out due to a massive heart attack and had to be hospitalized, okay? So often it is not sudden, the body does give warning signals. Another one, same thing, 46 year old runner, history of running for two years, attempted one half marathon, was a regular swimmer as well. Um, he was unwell since Monday evening, went for a swim on Tuesday, ran on Wednesday, was uncomfortable, pain in the upper back and arm, which was persistent, despite the discomfort, did not listen to his body. 
uh, posted out on Wednesday. Again, he went to the swimming pool. And when he reached home, he was not feeling good. And by the evening, he suffered a massive heart attack. Again, somebody who had warning signs for two or three days and ignored it and unfortunately suffered the consequences. Okay, So we need to be really careful. So we're reaching the last, um, you could say, part of my talk, which is what happens if you overdose. So we always have this thing of if exercise is medicine is too much of a good thing, uh, bad. Okay, we know running is excellent for you, but is too much running bad? And similarly, I had a question which I had asked Niranjan to ask all of you, is that how many of you have had a family member who's actually been worried or even a friend, close friend, that, Arey Baba, you're running, you're running all these marathons. Is it okay? I worry for you. We read all these reports. How many of you have had somebody close to you worry about you? Okay. You can just, just put a yes if you had somebody worry and Niranjan can uh, compile those answers. This was a study published, I think, in 2012, which created waves. It spoke about potential adverse cardiovascular effects from excessive endurance exercise. And the first author was Dr. James O'Keefe. He also has a very famous um, TEDx talk, which sort of, or a YouTube talk, which has gone viral. And while I agree with some of the points he makes, a lot of them um, I would not agree with. So in that article, he wrote that intense endurance exercise induces acute RV dysfunction while largely sparing the LV. And I'll explain to you what this is. RV stands for right ventricle and LV stands for left ventricle. They are the lower chambers of your heart. And all our research tells us or has shown us that your left ventricle, the main pumping chamber of your heart, gets bigger, stronger with exercise, while the RV has not been studied all that much. Okay? And he found that long-term training for extreme endurance exercise may okay, lead to myocardial fibrosis, meaning scarring on the heart muscle and remodeling change in the shape of the heart in a small subgroup. And because of this fibrosis, there may be what are called arrhythmias, abnormal heart rhythms. Okay, research has shown that runners who've been running for many, many years, and when I talk many years, it means 20 years, running an average of 50, 70, 100 kilometers, week after week, which very few people in our country, frankly, do, again, because of the weather as well. Um, they are they tend to have higher atrial fibrillation, okay, which is one a type of an abnormal heart rhythm. It's not really dangerous, but um, I'm just going to leave it at that in the QA. If you have anything specific, we can, we can talk about that. Okay. Okay. I'm going to skip this slide. I'm going to get to the part. Okay, so Niranjan tells me 56% had family members worrying. Isn't that ironic? So exercise is meant, not is meant to, is good for you. And rather than those 100% of family members tapping you on the back and says, go on, do more. You're going to be healthy. You're going to live longer. You're going to live healthier. I love the fact that you're doing it. 56% actually worry for you. Okay, so let's address their worry. What can we do? There are several papers which talk about what do we need to do for evaluation. This is a good one by... Matt Boryson, uh, again, another good friend who I meet at the CSM every year, along with Sanjay Sharma, who's the medical director of the London Marathon and has been there for a long time, and Domenico Corrado and Antonio Pelliccia from Italy, who are the world leaders in the field. They came out with a statement that what is the testing for cardiovascular evaluation of middle-aged and senior individuals engaging in sports activities, okay? So there are two categories, people who are sedentary, and people who are active. Obviously, the group I'm talking to is not sedentary, you're already active. So what about the active group, okay? So if you're doing low intensity activity, then the arrow comes down and says, you know what, you're eligible. You don't really need to um, do anything further. But obviously what most of you are doing when you're running marathons, it can't be called low intensity. It's depending on your pace, it's anywhere between moderate to frankly high. So there's a self-assessment of risk. There are several forms which ask you, do you feel short of breath when you run? Do you get chest discomfort? Things like that. And if you say no, 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 no to all of them, then you are eligible to go ahead. If you say yes to any of those questions, or if you're doing high intensity activity, better to be screened by your doctor. And again, ideally by a doctor who understands sports medicine, who understands sports cardiology. Okay. And then the doctor may decide if you're a low risk person, you're 27, 28, 30 years old, 
there's not too much of a family history you don't smoke your pressure is fine your sugar is fine they may say you know what go ahead and and carry on uh, with with your exercise no need to do any test okay if you're in the high risk group okay then you might or not you might you will probably be suggested further evaluation and a common test is a stress test okay a stress test is when you put on an ecg on your on your chest you go on the treadmill or on the cycle and and there is a graded exercise which goes harder and harder till you can't go any further and then they look at the ecg changes have any of you done a stress test why don't you just answer yes or how many of you have done a stress test it'll just be interesting to see that okay so that's your evaluation um there's new technology also which is great in monitoring okay there's a new technology called frontier x and and they have a strap and you get live ecg this is my sort of ecg while i was running this was taken somewhere in uh, uh march of last year or 30th march last year and it also gives you breathing and i'll try and show you a live version of it today in the q and i'm actually wearing the strap but i don't want to stop my slide show to show it to you but there's different technologies which can monitor you people have wrist watches which monitor um straps which monitor all of it can be very useful okay this is some of the data you get from the device i'm going to sort of end with um this very very technical slide i use it during normally our cardiology conferences but again you seem to be such a enlightened group so i thought i'll share it with you in one slide you can sum up all the cardiovascular benefits of exercise okay the first group is what are called anti atherosclerotic the blockage which forms in your arteries are called plaques so what leads to the formation of the plaque the plaque is called atherosclerosis the process the things like your blood pressure uh, lipids fat all of these things which are improved by exercise okay um anti thrombotic which means the clot that forms which leads to the heart attack so it helps prevent the clot which leads to the heart attack it has anti arrhythmic activity so typically when you get a cardiac arrest your heart goes into an abnormal rhythm and exercising heart is less likely to go into a abnormal rhythm and last is anti ischemic ischemia means lack of oxygen supply to the heart muscle so with exercise the oxygen supply to the heart muscle also increases okay so let's now come to the conclusions before we go on to the q and a so what we spoke about is that the benefits of exercise in the treatment and prevention of chronic disease are clearly proven there's no debate about that okay fitness confers protective benefits against death and disease yes niranjan i saw that only 26% have undergone a stress test we'll talk about that okay however fitness does not provide immunity this is a very important line okay often if you ever hear about somebody who was young and fit and they collapsed or something bad happened everybody asks are but what happened how could it happen he was so fit he was so fit or she was so fit the good news is it happens very rarely in women during running so it it usually is he was so fit it uh what happens rarely meaning women rarely have heart issues with running but fitness does not give you immunity i give an example i tell people saying that when you say that he was so fit how could he have a heart problem it's like saying that this car had perfect brakes the brakes worked perfectly fine how could the car have an accident brakes are one important ingredient in preventing your car from having an accident but just because your brakes work fine doesn't mean you cannot have an accident right so fitness gives you protection against many of these issues which we spoke about but just because you're fit doesn't mean it can't happen it does not give you immunity event rate for those participating marathon running is one death per 259000 runners so therefore extremely low regular exercise provides protection against sudden cardiac death during exertion however there is some emerging evidence that there may be adverse cardiac changes related to very large volumes of endurance training long term training for extreme endurance exercise may i repeat may lead to some fibrosis and scarring 
Is this fibrosis temporary or permanent? We don't know yet. And the last one also is very important, especially for groups like this. You do not have to run marathons to reap the health benefits of exercise, okay? So if you want to just be healthy, you can go out and run three, four days a week, half an hour, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, and you can be healthy. I always believe that people who run marathon, you're doing it kind of for something more, right? As a sense of achievement. So by all means, go ahead and do it. But don't say that I, I'm running marathons just to be healthy because you can be healthy in other ways as well. So I'm going to conclude with some of my favorite um, slides, okay? This actually used to be my, when I returned from the US, I'd got this. This was my mouse pad. And this is what it said, what it said, okay? Let me see if I can, yes. Many of you may have seen it earlier. You can see the picture of the lion and the gazelle in the background. And it says that every morning in Africa, a lion wakes up and it knows it must run faster than the slowest gazelle or it will starve to death. Okay, it's not going to get its food if it can't outrun the gazelle. Now, what if you're a gazelle? Then every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up and it knows it must run faster than the fastest lion or it will be killed. Okay, so therefore, what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is very interesting, which says that it doesn't matter whether you're a lion or whether you're a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you better be running. Okay, and I know all of you in the audience can certainly identify with this sentiment. Okay, so I'm going to just end with, um, this is just a picture of my book, The Heart Truth. It's all about heart disease prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation. It's available on, on Amazon. So any of you are interested, you can please uh, go ahead and get it. Thank you so much for being a patient audience. I assume you're a patient audience. I can't see you, but I assume that you've been a patient audience and you uh, absorb at least some parts of the talk. And very happy to open it up to Q&A. So thanks once again. Yeah, thank you, Ashish. Uh, that was a lucid presentation. It definitely uh, did answer a lot of uh, queries that were bothering us with the matters of the heart with respect to long distance running. Um, well, let's not, and, but then there are, there's a deluge of questions that we've got on the FB chat. Okay. And uh, let's not uh, really delay. Let's get on with the first question. Okay. Um, so the first one I want to know was, um, you did speak about heart checks and all that. So would you actually recommend a heart check to anyone who's taking up long distance running? Would it be a blanket prescription or would it be for certain people? Like, is there a criteria that you would attach to, to you know, doing yeah. a heart test during, uh, I mean, as they're graduating, let's say from a half marathon to full marathon or something like that, or everybody just gets one done before they take up long distance running? I think this is a great question and obviously there's no one size fits all answer, but I think that anyone taking up long distance running in a serious manner should at least talk to their family doctor before they're taking it up, right? Because there's such a variety in you could be young when you're starting, you could be older, you could have risk factors, you may not have risk factors, you may be a smoker, you may not, you may have been a smoker in the past, you may be overweight, you may not, you may have been an athlete in the past. So certainly have a conversation with your doctor for sure, at the very least. Um, on an annual basis, I think everyone, rather runner or not runner, must at least know simple things like their weight, their blood pressure, their sugar and their cholesterol, okay? So all it takes is just one, one blood pressure reading and one simple blood test. That's the very least you need to know. Now, should you do a test like stress test, CT and Joe, that should be dependent on person to person. So I wouldn't blanket tell everybody to go out and do a stress test, but you should be um, evaluated for your profile. And if necessary, then it should be recommended. Thank you, Ashish. So the uh, next question was, um, you know, we've been, this is from Dr. Sonali Chaturvedi. And, yeah. and um, you, we, you did mention in your presentation that um, the percentage of deaths or fatalities that may happen during a marathon event 
is definitely minuscule but then yes it is big for the family or the you know yes. the individual or the family where it's happening so what is it that the what is it that the runner is missing see he if he's running a marathon even he's obviously trained and gone through the whole rigmarole of it so what is it that is missing that is causing something like this to happen i mean why do we have this coming up as headlines on and off okay this is a good question and a difficult question and i'll tell you why i say it's a difficult question um there are a large number of people as i showed you who do get some warning signs okay but they tend to ignore them so shortness of breath with usual exertion is a very classic warning sign which means if you are used to running 10 kilometers at say 6 minute per kilometer pace and now you start feeling tired at you know after 7 kilometers or you can't hold that 6 minute anymore you have to go down to 6:15 6:30 all else being same weather etc course being same then you need to question that not just one day or two days but if you start seeing a trend you you know you're getting more tired with the same amount of exertion so one is people tend to ignore some of the symptoms oh that's okay that's normal it can't happen to me okay and that's the most dangerous i do believe that at least 50% of people get some warning signs the second part is genuinely there is a certain amount or certain percentage where there isn't anything and it literally comes out of the blue and now that's nature that's life that's the human body you're a doctor you deal with with ladies with deliveries you know that beyond the point you can't predict everything right that's the 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 enigma of the human body and mother nature that even somebody who otherwise had a clean chit of health it happened and that's just a risk we accept or uh, the one thing actually i do want to point out though and this is important please understand that very very rarely does would somebody die because of running if they're otherwise healthy so what happens is that particular run on which they collapsed etc that was the final straw which pushed them think of somebody standing at the edge of a cliff and that was the final straw so it wasn't like that person was completely healthy instead of collapsing that day they may have collapsed 3 days later in their office or in their house or a month later okay so there was there was underlying like a volcano the volcano was passive and dormant and growing inside and that run was the final push just the same way as smoking could be a final push stress could be a final push very very rare that a completely healthy person just goes out and collapses that may be because of just extreme weather conditions or extreme pushing but very rare that's something to keep in mind also yeah something as you said in your presentation one is listen to me listen to your body yeah. and secondly of course exercise does not give you immunity also absolutely so, yes you know, that is what uh so there is a question milan rai has asked uh, what's your take on um, hard zone based training and there's a lot of those so, questions coming milan up. milan i think i think uh, training within hard zones and using it i think that's great now when you say hard zone based training it just simply means that being cognizant of your heart rate while you're training now different there are different theories that you know train in this zone versus that zone is better some people only very low very high that's different i'm not commenting on an individual um philosophy but using your heart rate to aid you in training is very important but please remember weather conditions matter a lot okay i was actually going to post some of my run details from this morning i ran a 10k this morning okay and it was 32 degrees uh, yeah it was 32 degrees at 5:40 in the morning in mumbai and the weather weather sort of bureau chart said it feels like 39 and i i died on that run okay my average heart rate was um what was it 160 something and i went and saw that when i did that same run about 3 weeks ago okay it was like 144 or something okay everything else being same that much of a difference so weather does also affect the heart rate so a lot of indian runners come and show me that oh is it dangerous for me to run at a higher heart rate in general it's not dangerous but your the higher your intensity and time is is inversely proportional you get tired quicker if you're pushing yourself harder and obviously if you got something underlying then yes then going at a heart rate which is very high could potentially be dangerous 
Uh, the next question is from Raghu Pitambaram. Uh, what are your thoughts on resting heart rate uh, metric as an indication of cardiac health? Resting heart rate metric as an indication of cardiac health. Raghu, I think resting heart rate metric is a reasonable indicator of cardiac health, but I don't believe that it's like some sort of a, a very important indicator. Like there are people who every single morning wake up and are plotting their resting heart rate. I don't, I personally don't think that that's a, a very sharp indicator. There are many more indicators that you could use. Obviously, if you're a runner and your resting heart rate is in the you know high 80s, 90s, upward, then you need to question why that is. That does, that would be a bit strange. But otherwise, you know, if, if my resting heart rate is 55 versus yours being 58 versus somebody being 62 or 64 doesn't necessarily mean that the 55 person is the, you know, the fittest or the healthiest. Okay, there is correlation, but it's not like don't use it as a specific metric uh, of performance. Okay, Pawan is asking as an entry level runner, how should I train my heart? Uh, how should I improve my you know, breathing so that so that I can run longer? I am a I am an entry level runner. I haven't just participated so, in any. So one training. is I wouldn't. Uh, a lot of people tend to focus on breathing and try to change the breathing pattern or should I only breathe through my nose, should I only breathe through my mouth, etc. I would say, Bhavan, just be natural about it. Follow. The one thing you all must do is follow a sensible training plan. Okay. The only two parameters of success in long distance running, and I know it's going to sound very silly when I say this because it's so obvious. There are only, that's my belief, only two. One is have a good training plan. And number two is stick to it. And while this sounds obvious, you'll be shocked as to how many people do bizarre training plans. I've had people come up to me one weekend before a marathon. They're doing a 30K on a Saturday and a 30K on a Sunday to prepare for the full marathon next week. This is bizarre. Today, you can Google it. There are 100,000 sensible plans. I'm sure, you know, the Hyderabad runners group, you're taking care of each other. Just talk to, talk to an experienced runner. They'll give you a good plan. So certainly... Make a good plan, which you can adhere to within your constraints of lifestyle, etc. And stick to it. While that sounds easy or sounds obvious, it's not always easy to stick to the plan. Okay. Yeah, okay. There's a long question from Mr. Anand. So he says, stabilizing the heart rate in math is one of the greatest challenges. One of the challenges is that the heart rate drops rapidly when I walk, even if I'm walking faster than my run. The moment I run, my heart rate rises rapidly beyond my math, math heart rate. In short, I am able to maintain the eight pace with my walk below my math heart rate to about 115, but goes beyond 130 once I start running, even if it's a 9.3 pace. I'm 55 years old. My math rate is supposed to be 125. I've been running for a year. I've done 20 half marathons in this year and a couple of half full marathons. Average resting heart rate is 54 beats per minute. He wants to know what's going wrong here. Okay, Anand, there's a lot of information in that question. Um, let me try and frankly answer more generically because when you're trying to, like, you know, you're giving a medical advice per person, you need to know so much more about what's going on than just a question that's asked over a social media platform, right? So my... My answer to that would be that it's very common for people's heart rate to jump dramatically when they shift from a walk to a run. Okay, even if it's a fast walk versus a slow run, the action of running where you're, both your feet are off the ground, for a lot of people, the heart rate goes up a lot. Now, if you're following a very specific plan, okay, when you're saying math, math, I assume you're referring to film methadone, um, you know, then, then there are some rules. Then you follow the rules. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure why it's going um, as high as it is. But a lot of things like the time of day you go out, especially, again, weather, heat, humidity, all that has a disproportionate um, effect on the heart rate, causing it to go up. Now, if you are comfortable at a slightly higher heart rate and you're not visibly out of breath, um, I wouldn't personally get too stressed out just because that heart rate is higher. Now, if that's breaking the rules of the plan you've set, now that's a different different story and you need to slow it down. But from a purely health perspective, I wouldn't worry about it. All other things being fine. Next question is from Coach K, race director of Uti Ultra. 
does a sports medicine doctor see different aspects of our heart compared to a regular cardiologist please share how hypertrophy run affects runners who have been running since their childhood like the kenyans yeah so coach um definitely in any specialization a person uh, who has spent more time with that subset um would have greater insight so somebody who understands sports would be better able to comment with this classic examples of hypertrophy okay since you brought up hypertrophy there is what's called physiological hypertrophy which means normal hypertrophy and pathological hypertrophy which is abnormal and it's like a venn diagram okay when does physiology and pathology you know they merge at a certain at a certain point so when you are doing a lot of endurance training your heart volume expands and earlier the thinking was endurance training expands your heart volume while strength training expands the the muscle thickness the wall hypertrophy okay now we found that any intense exercise can expand um, both the volume and the wall thickness if that um is physiological it means a bigger and a stronger heart let me give you an example okay somebody who's constantly lifting heavy weights their bicep will be say large and big but it's strong and muscle and that muscle can be used think of an older person you know especially older ladies sometimes who are a little bit heavy in size and you might see them having very large arms very large biceps in just if you look at the girth and the diameter but they tend to be flabby so though they're large in size they're not effective so hypertrophy think of that as that flabby large heart which is not effective while well, an athlete's heart is a strong large heart but does not mean that a athlete also cannot have an abnormality superimposed on a strong heart so that that becomes a gray zone as to when does when is high level of normal going into abnormal and there are criteria like i showed you and therefore somebody who understands all this must uh, comment on it uh next questions from prashant murpariya as a long distance runner with respect to cardiac health what should be the variable for me to manage better the distance i run or the heart rate at which i run or both or can you suggest some kind of an optimal combination so you know i mean if you want to improve your heart health okay um let's not get too caught up in the metrics and there's a medical reason you need to like i said if you're exercising those 3 to 5 days a week 30 to 50 minutes and and part of your exercise is at a at a lower heart rate some parts of it at a higher heart rate such that your rating of exertion you're maintaining in that fairly light to somewhat hard zone for most of your run and maybe going into hard to very hard for small bits of your run then you're going to get benefit don't get too fixated on you know i'll only get benefit if my heart rate is is so much today when i was running i i mean though it was a 10k so distance wise it wasn't a big deal okay um but but just the because the heat and humidity was so high i had a hard time maintaining my pace and and there are days like that which is fine but i can't be doing that all the time every day so going into your high heart rate zone for small periods of time there's nothing wrong with it it's just that you don't do that for long periods of time okay uh there's another question from coach k um yeah. he's saying um okay please share some insights on how many fatalities are generally found in ultra marathon event versus a full or a half um isn't it that the there is higher risk in shorter um shorter and faster events yes sometimes paradoxically that is the thing because in the shorter events the intensity is higher so often you might have your um you might have a higher fatalities in a half marathon versus a full because they are pushing themselves much harder and in ultra events you might not for two reasons one is the people who take part in ultras by almost by definition tend to be those who have been running for years and years they know their body a little bit better and also their intensity doesn't tend to be that high okay but bottom line is that the number of fatalities etc by itself is very very low so let's not get to sort of fixated on the whole fatality thing okay what i am going to do dr madhu with your permission let me while while we speaking also let me get my this strap going and i want to show yeah. our viewers how this thing works it's quite interesting yeah. 
But carry on with the questions. That's right. Okay, so the next question is from Sagarika, who is also the vice president of Hyderabad Runners. Yeah. Uh, she says, um, so this is basically a woman-specific uh, question. Is there anything specific to cardiac risk for women above 50 uh, that one needs to be aware of or anything special? I mean, okay, okay. You know, let me answer that. Yeah. Mm. I'll answer that. In the meanwhile, I'll just let me do this quick screen share. If Niranjan, you allow me to do it while I've got this, okay? Um, so can you see this? Can you see the ECG? Yes. So this is my live ECG as I am sitting and 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 talking to you. Okay, I just got a strap around my chest, that typical polar heart rate strap. And this not only can give me the ECG, it can give me my breathing rate and also it's quite it's quite neat because it's the first time in so many years, and it's by an Indian company. It's called uh, Frontier X out of Bangalore. First time I found a device which is very convenient and easy to use. And this is what it looks like, you know, and you start ECG sharing. And it's at the same time very, uh, a very good and a stable ECG. So that's quite interesting, okay? For anyone who's, you know, interested in, in going to the next level of monitoring themselves. So, yeah, uh, there is a question. Sorry, yeah. Let me, let me answer her question first. The question mm -hmm. was on, on women over 50, okay? So the one, the one good news for women is that in all these events, whenever you comb the literature, um, sudden cardiac death for women during endurance events is very, very low in the first place. Now, heart disease in women is not lower than in men. Heart disease kills as many women as it does men. It's the leading cause of death in women, as you know, killing many more women all over the world than breast cancer, which typically is thought of as a woman's disease. The one good thing is there is protection. And the theory is that estrogen is, is also giving protection. So till menopause, the women's risk tends to be lower. And after menopause, it becomes an equal opportunity killer and it catches up. So all the, all the care and precautions we spoke about, especially for ladies over 50, should be the same. The one thing to keep in mind where heart uh, ailments are concerned, the typical chest discomfort or angina, what we call it, uh, in women, the sign tends to be more just shortness of breath as opposed to angina. And the other very sad statistic is that often when a woman is short of breath or something is happening, it's, it's dismissed and not thought of as heart disease while the man would quickly be rushed to hospital. There are statistics all over the world. It's not just an Indian phenomenon that the ladies, unfortunately, have the problem or just sit at home, rest, you're under stress, relax it out while the man is quickly rushed and things are done. Okay, so... Uh, do not think that, oh, it's a lady, so it cannot be heart disease, especially if it's over 50 and they're getting shortness of breath, which is unusual. Certainly start thinking of heart disease and certainly go and take, uh, go to the hospital. Don't wait for your doctor to come home because time is muscle, which means the more time you waste, the more your heart muscle gets damaged. So you were just uh, discussing about the chest strap and the heart monitor just now. Yeah, so so there was a question this. from... Udit yeah. Arora, how reliable are the wrist HR monitor, heart rate monitors? I mean, so Udit, don't I, wear them. So yeah, as as uh, as technology is getting better, I wear one, but this I use more for my step count as opposed to my my heart rate count. I think the better uh, machines are reasonably accurate, especially at rest. The exercise heart rate. Um, there, there sometimes can be an issue in accuracy, but please remember when you suddenly somebody tells you, oh, my you know, chest or my, my heart, uh, wrist heart rate showed uh, 200 or 220 and somebody's 40 or 50 years old, that's usually a wrong reading. So momentarily, you might get a wrong reading. So look for a trend. Mm -hmm. So if you say that my heart rate touches 200, it should be there for at least few seconds. If not, that's just a an error in reading. But otherwise, as we're getting better with technology, reasonably accurate. But chest measurement usually beats uh, beats the uh, wrist measurement. So we do know that uh, you are so just, uh, just to complete to it, This is what I was wearing. I took it out while I'm talking. Yeah. This, is, this is exactly what I was wearing. And this small little thing is the is what is the heart of it. Yes, carry on, please. Yeah, so we do know that you, um, uh, you're basically into cardiac rehabilitation and there's a lot yeah. of experience that you've got yeah. in that. So can you tell us a bit more about your work with the 
you know, getting uh, patients post cardiac events back into a happy yeah. lifestyle. So when I when I was in Asian art and we used to do the cardiac rehab, we um, exercise was part and parcel of their um, routine uh, care. And then many of them, when we had the first Mumbai Marathon in 2004, when we had the dream run, that time the dream run was seven kilometers and subsequently it became six. I told some of them that, hey, you're exercising. Do you want to take the next step? And I remember in the first year, 26 of them took part in the dream run. And then the following year, they said, oh, why can't we do some more and some more? And, and, and you know, it never stopped. So now uh, every year we have about 100 people doing it. And they do the most of them, uh, many of them do the half marathon, some do the full marathon. And, and my patients who've been running since 2007, they still, they form, they've in fact got a club called the Zipper Club because when you have a bypass surgery, it's like a zip put in front. They call themselves the Zipper Club and they're running on an average 10, 15 uh, marathons a year. So there is nothing. And, and one of them, um, the Nanje, he's done full marathons on I think now all seven continents. He just finished in Antarctica last December. So really, you know, I, I tell people that heart disease is not the end of your life or a bypass surgery or an angioplasty. It's the beginning of a new lease of life. It doesn't matter whether you're 50, 55, 60. If you want to do it, you can. You don't have to do it. Like I said, you don't have to run marathons to reap the health benefits of exercise. But if you want to, age and illness should not be a bar, obviously provided you checked up properly and all of that. So coming to the um, quintessential uh, question of the season, to run or not to run with the mask. This is from Abhijit okay. Dube. Should we be running? Okay. There's a lot, lot being yeah. discussed yes. you know, all over the all over media, a, social media. I did a webinar on the subject on Wednesday evening and the person Venkat, he asked me to do it. I said, are you kidding? How can we spend one hour talking on a mask and we spend it talk, ended up spending one and a half hours talking in the mask. So I'll just give you some very quick takeaway messages on this, okay? And here I'm talking from a science angle, not from a rule angle. So if you live in an area where the cop is saying you've got to wear a mask, come what may, then that's not what we're discussing. From a scientific angle, when you're running, okay, not just walking, you're running, it's very hard and uncomfortable to run with the mask on. So if you're able to maintain a 20-foot difference, okay, which is roughly six meters, normally they say keep, keep six feet distance, I'm saying keep six meters distance because all the research has shown that when you're running, the virus may go a little bit quicker. But unless it's some superstar, superman virus, it nothing ever goes 20 feet and certainly not in enough quantity to cause you any trouble. So if you're able to maintain a 20-foot distance be between the runners, then there should be no problem in running without a mask. So one practical thing is run with the mask maybe like this and run separate from each other early in the morning, late in the evening. And if you find that someone's coming and you're approaching somebody, then maybe you can just quickly put it on out of courtesy. Because remember, when you wear a mask, you're not really protecting yourself. You're protecting someone else from getting infected from you. So wear that on and sort of take it out. That's just a very practical way of looking at it. Some of these reports that these teenagers died in China because of wearing masks and exercising and all, I think we need to know more about that. There's, it sounds to me a little bit odd that only wearing a mask killed two 22-year-old or you know 18-year-old kids. I, I find that a little bit hard to believe. Okay. Yeah. So um, Ashish, that was amazing. The Q&A segment really went well. I think we were able to pick up a whole load of questions and you really answered them uh, crisply and to the point. So thank as you, you for as, that. As you guided me yesterday, did I meet the criteria? Totally, totally. Okay, Thank okay. you so much for that. It was a pleasure having you. And I now uh, hand this over to Sandeep Reddy for the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madhu, for the Q&A facilitation. Friends, I hope that was a very informative and inspiring talk. We hope you enjoyed attending the session. One line which I really liked from Dr. Ashish's talk was, exercise needs nothing other than just your heart. And of course, there were many other inputs from the talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashish, for all the valuable inputs. Our deepest gratitude to you for taking your time out and sharing your experience and learnings with us today. And to all our lovely audience, 
we appreciate you for being here and asking all those brainstorming questions and thank you for choosing to spend time with us today please feel free to ask any more questions you have for ashish in the comment section we will try to get the answers the recording of this session will be available on our hyderabad runners facebook page please come back to watch it again or you may as well share it on your profiles or to those who can benefit from this we will be back next saturday with yet another expert and yet another intriguing topic for you just as you mark all your sunday uh, long runs on a sunday morning please do mark your saturday evenings as well uh, from 7:30 pm to 8:30 pm for beyond the track webinars we hope to see you every saturday until then this is sandeep reddy from hyderabad runners signing off stay home stay safe stay healthy and bye bye